Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and when I was a child, even a teenager growing up, as much as I loved baseball, I never dreamt of playing shortstop for the Brooklyn Dodgers. I never imagined becoming a major league ball player. I didn't dream of it. But what I did dream of was in some way being part of the Broadway musical theater, of being a composer of Broadway shows. And I listened to all the, I knew all the shows. I knew all the composers. I wanted to be a Rodgers and Hammerstein. I wanted to be Jerome Kern or the Gershwin brothers or Cole Porter or Cy Coleman or Frank Lesser. I wanted to be Lerner and Lowe, Meredith Wilson, Jerry Herman, Kander and Ebb, and Sondheim. And boy, the list goes on and on and on and on. Endless, extraordinary, talented people who create beautiful moments on Broadway. So lucky, lucky me. On this edition of L'Chaim, I have the joy of presenting to you a man responsible for some of the most wonderful classic Broadway shows. Wicked, Pippin, Godspell. And as we do this edition of L'Chaim, his latest show, The Prince of Egypt. So it's a real kick for me to welcome to L'Chaim, Stephen Schwartz. Stephen Schwartz, it is so wonderful for me to have a chance to speak with you, one of my musical theater heroes. As I've said in the open, you are, you are a genius. And to be able to have you and just talk to you for a few moments is very kind of you. Thank you for joining us on L'Chaim. Marcus, absolutely my pleasure. Good to talk to you. Um, so first, I want to understand a little bit about who in the world you are, uh, and I've read something about you, but I, I want to understand, you know, wh where were you raised? Where did you grow up as a kid, Stephen? I am a Long Island Jewish boy. You are? Uh, I am indeed, yeah. Most of my childhood was spent in Roslyn Heights, I went to Mineola High School, uh, all of this in Nassau County on Long Island. The little um, community that I grew up in, which was a kind of Levitt town community, was literally called South Park, for which I get a lot of ribbing now. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, there, there, were, there were those little um, quarter acre plots that um my, my dad was a world war ii vet and so he and uh, my mom you know moved in there subsequently uh and yeah most of my most of my childhood was there i guess uh okay. i graduated from high school in 64 and hold on you know, hold on, so hold, on. Late 50s, early 60s. hold on what were your parents names my parents' names are yeah. Stanley and Sheila, and they live right now in Great Neck, um, in, a, in an apartment in Great Neck. Okay. Any siblings, Stephen? I have a sister named Marge. Uh, she lives out on the West Coast in Santa Barbara. Okay. What kind of Jewish home did you, were you raised in? Well, it was pretty much a secular a uh, Jewish home in that uh, we celebrated the holidays, of course, and still do. We still celebrate Passover and Hanukkah and um, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, of course, but that was kind of it. Um, we didn't go to temple um, 
it was so it was it was sort of more intellectually and culturally Jewish. I understand. Than you. Jewish. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a bar mitzvah ceremony? I, I did not have a bar mitzvah. However, subsequently, I decided that I was interested in studying um, some stuff. So um, I guess at least in reformed and conservative Judaism, you could be what was called confirmed at 15. And so I, I went and did that and took some classes and wrote a paper about Moses Maimonides and, and I was confirmed. Very good. Good for you. There okay. you go. You were, I interrupted you when you told me you were going to Mineola High School? Yes, public school on Long Island. And I used to drive, or I used to take the train, excuse me, into New York City on Saturdays to attend uh, Juilliard, the preparatory division. And I studied piano and composition there. Did your parents have you study a musical instrument? Um, no, it was kind of the other way around. My parents had a good friend who lived next door to us in South Park, in Roslyn Heights, who was a composer. Um, also a Jewish composer, as most composers, it seems, are. Um, his name was George Kleinsinger, and he was well known for writing what would now be called concept albums. He wrote an album called Tubby the Tuba and another ballad for Americans, and he also wrote um, something called Archie and Mehitabel, which when we first met him and moved there uh, was being turned into a Broadway show called Shinbone Alley. And so on occasion, my parents would go over, would go next door and I would come with them. And George might, one of the songs that he was working on for the show. And I'm told, though I don't have direct memory of this, that after he was finished, I would go over to his piano and kind of pick out the tune. And so after a couple of times, George said to my parents, look, I, I think Steve might have some musical ability. He obviously has an ear and he obviously has an interest. Maybe you should consider getting him piano lessons. So that's how my parents got a piano and that's how that happened. Seven years old. Seven I years old. Yeah. And Stephen, at that time, did you already have a sense that your you had a relationship with music and the piano? Completely. I knew that because of George Kleinsinger and his working on this show, um, which my parents ultimately took me to see when it opened and had that kind of epiphany that people describe when they wind up going into the theater, the same thing happened to me. And I thought, well, this is, this is where I want to live my life. So I want to write um, for musical theater. So my parents, although they're not in the arts at all and they're not musical, were avid theater goers um, and musical theater goers. We had all the cast albums in our house, which I would listen to. Um, and then I used to go to the library, since we had libraries in those days, yes. and uh, take out the, I guess, the libretti, the books yes. of musical, particularly ones I hadn't seen. And I would um, look at the lyrics and I would write tunes to them. And then I would get the, um, the cast album, often from the library, and, and listen and hear what the composer or composers had actually done. And I'm just curious, you are a hair younger than I am. What were the shows you were listening to on record albums in your home as a kid? Well, certainly Rodgers and Hammerstein, South Pacific, and King and I remains my favorite musical. Yes. I definitely remember My Fair Lady. Um, yes. And, and listening to that a great deal. I remember a little bit later um, getting, as a, again, as a present, probably for Hanukkah, uh, um, I got the cast album for Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Yes. Um, and I remember really liking that. Um, Richard Rodgers, No Strings. Uh, those are ones that I that I remember okay. vividly. Okay, and which shows as a young person you remember actually seeing? I saw the original West Side Story. I saw My Fair Lady and saw Julie Andrews' last performance, although um, Max Harrison had left by then. I remember seeing uh, Gypsy with Ethel Merman and saying to my parents afterwards, 
that's the best musical I've ever seen. And them kind of laughing because I'd only seen like, you know, 12 shows at that point. But, and, and, but I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is the best musical I've ever seen. So I remember that pretty vividly. I, I can still picture certain um, things that happened on stage, you know, in Gypsy, in West Side Story, in My Fair Lady. Were you a Lerner and Lowe fan? Did you like Camelot? Um, I like the music to Camelot. You know, I, I think there are some problems in the show, definitely, but I, I absolutely love the music. Did you get to see Funny Girl? I loved Funny Girl. Oh. Again, when I saw that, um, and I saw it originally with uh, Barbara Streisand and thought that was the best musical comedy performance or musical theater performance I had ever I seen. I agree 100%. And I, I saw it three times. So I think that show is, is, is a little bit underrated. Uh, yeah. And I also did that summer stock. Candor and Ebb, what do you think of them? Oh, well, you know, first of all, they, um, of course, Fred is gone now, but John and Fred became friends of mine. Um, I was a huge fan of Cabaret um, and how staging, you know, all, all of that sort of changed how I thought about musical theater, what you could do, what it could look like. I'm, I'm so much about storytelling and about the book of a show. Um, that's so central to me, so. And I'm gonna to get to you and your stories in one more moment. We're almost through with my litany. What about you <laughs> and Stephen Sondheim? Well, I'm, you know, how can one not be an enormous admirer of Steve's? Um, as I said, one of the cast albums that I really listened to over and over again when I was younger was Funny Thing Happened. and. Um, I really, without even knowing that I was studying it, I was really studying how Steve structures songs, how no one has ever built to a finish um, as well as Steve. You can learn a lot if you're gonna write for musical theater um, about how, how you build a song to really land it at the end. I don't think anyone's ever done that as well as he. Um, and of course, how he constructs his lyrics um, is enormously um, instructive for, yes. for someone who wants to write for musical theater. So I've always been a great admirer of his work. Stephen, did you ever meet Leonard Bernstein? I worked with Leonard Bernstein um, I, because I worked on the Bernstein Mass, uh, which right. opened the Kennedy Center. Right. And with, uh, I'm not really dropping a name by calling him Lenny because he insisted that um, he be called Lenny. Um, yeah, but I, I helped Lenny sort of with the structure of that and also on the English text for that. Um, he was extremely influential on me and probably the closest thing I've ever had to a mentor, even though we only worked together for um, about three or four months because more than uh, my learning from him about um, craft, it was, I, I appreciated how he treated other people and he, again, generosity of spirit. And, um, and I observed a lot of that and, and thought, you know, if I, if I get to be famous or whatever, or I get to be, you know, really successful. I, I'm really going to try to remember how he how he dealt with other people and sort of his whole morality, if you will. That's um, lovely. Which I had enormous respect. That is lovely to hear. As you were developing your talent, were your parents supportive, or did they worry about their son going into the entertainment world? You know, I'd love to have that story about, you know, my unsupportive parents and that I had to fight them, but, I, but that's not the truth. My parents have always been enormously supportive. In fact, when I was thinking of going to Carnegie Mellon for college and being, you know, not getting a sort of standard degree, I was the one who was a little concerned and my dad said, look, this is what you want to do. This is your dream. And if, you know, if it doesn't work out, you can always go back to school. You know, I mean, they were, um, you know, we weren't the, the, the most well off in the world and yet they managed to 
you know, provide for me so I could go to Juilliard when I was in high school, et cetera, and that I could go to Carnegie Mellon. And, um, you know, they they have always been very, very supportive. I'm glad to hear that. We, you mentioned story even before I got to it. One of the things that I wanted to understand was, it is not simply that you write music. And everybody should understand, you do the music and the lyrics, and you usually have a collaborator for the book, correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay. But in some way, are you the one who initiates the, the overall story? Or does somebody bring you a story? It, it varies. Sometimes, um, you know, I'll, uh, I'll be offered a show. Um, sometimes I'll come across an idea. Um, you know, Pippin started out when I was uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it was actually the idea of a, a friend of mine there. And we, we originally did it as a school show. Um, you know, uh, working, I came across the Studs Terkel book, Wicked. I heard about the novel by Gregory Maguire, but then there have been other, you know, Children of Eden was brought to me as a possible idea. Baker's Wife was brought to me as a possible idea. You know, so it, it varies okay. depending on the show. Um, what, give me an example of a show which you feel really the genesis came from you. I, I mean, really... The idea of doing Wicked as uh, a piece of musical theater, uh, that, that came from me. And, you know, I, I pursued getting the rights and, um, and, and being given the opportunity to do it. Um, and working, the, the adaptation of, uh, you know, both of them are adaptations, obviously. They're not original ideas, but the notion of doing them as, a, as musicals, um, you know, definitely came from me. Okay. Um, but what I was going to say is that, you know, the way musicals are shaped before, it's, it's not as if someone writes a script and hands you the script and then you say like, oh, okay, I'll write a song here and I'll write a song there. The, getting the structure of the story right before anybody writes anything is um, at least the, the process that uh, follow. And that's a very collaborative process. And it usually involves me and the book writer and sometimes the director, if, uh, if there's a director on the project early enough, and sometimes the lead producer. But, but it, it's, as I say, it's not about, and I think people don't really understand that, including some writers who want to write for musical theater. I think they don't really, they think like, oh, well, I'll just write a script and then we'll say song here and the, songwriters will stick the song there it, it doesn't work that way there's a there's a whole structure that gets figured out and then you identify well i think this part of the story probably is going to be told musically this feels more like it should be dialogue this feels like maybe we could tell it through dance you kind of figure out the whole way the story is going to be told and by the way very often do you not either add a song or take a song out as you continue to work the show? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, many, many songs get written that, that, aren't, that don't wind up in the show. Um, songs are constantly being revised right up until you freeze, is the word for it, the show, um, you know, before you open. Yeah, there's, it's, it's a constant, uh, um, it, it's just a constant process of, of trying to fine tune it and songs come in and songs come out and right. lyrics are constantly rewritten and so forth. And there's a real symbiotic relationship between the various people who are inputting creativity into this, you, your book, whoever wrote the book, who the director is, who the choreographer is, and in some way even, you know, it's, people don't understand, lighting is also very important to, to how That's a show feels. Really Everybody's working on it together, yes? Totally. I mean, it's interesting you should mention lighting because people often ask me about defying gravity and, you know, and, and why that moment, the end of the first act of Wicked, along with the song and the performance and the very clever staging by Joe Mantello and the sort of... Um, 
brilliant idea for the, the costume that Susan Hilferty came up with. But the secret weapon of that is Kenny Posner's lighting. I think the lighting for Defying Gravity, that one, I mean, the lighting throughout Wicked is amazing. But the lighting for Defying Gravity, I think, is the best lighting I have ever seen in the theater. And it's part of why that song is working so well. I understand. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, by the way, when Wicked opened, it did not open to rave reviews. And very often, if yeah. a musical does not get rave reviews, it has real trouble. It had, it's hard having legs. I want you to remember what what it was like when you know you and david and john you're you're looking at the reviews and to what extent do you say to yourself doesn't matter this show is going to be one of the classic people should understand it is behind lion king the largest grossing musical in broadway history and that indicates the extent to which over years it has been a audience favorite, a favorite of families who visit New York and also a fan of those who are just Broadway goers in New York. But I'd like to hear from you how, how that process went from opening night to the point where all you guys realize, holy cow, we have not only a hit, but a huge hit here. Well, I mean, first of all, my shows never get good reviews. So, um, and, 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 you know, on, on one level, I, that's, you know, I feel bad about that. I wish they did. But there's something about my sensibility, I guess. Um, though, of course, the show is, as we've just discussed, very collaborative. So it's, it's all a sum of its parts. But I've, I've just, I've never done a show that, basically got good reviews for the show. Um, but I've had, um, you know, a good deal of success. So I'm, I'm very accustomed to um, having the show ride past that, you know, ride past the reviews. Um, it's easier to do now than it used to be, frankly, with the internet and word of mouth, um, you know, reviews are less, uh, less important than they used to be. Um, what happened with Wicked was that um, we had been very successful in our out-of-town tryout, um, and we were getting pretty strong audience response during previews. And, um, you know, the reviews came out, and as you say, they were, you know, I mean, they weren't all terrible, I, but, um, but a lot of the important reviews were not good. And, you know, David said, well, I, you know, we're going to be okay anyway. Um, you know, Mark, Mark Platt, who's our other producer, you know, said, look, you, you can't create, you can't create word of mouth, but you also can't stop it. And that's what we have here. Absolutely. You know, we knew that people were coming out after the first act, calling their friends and saying, I'm, 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 I'm getting you tickets for this. You have to come see this. Um, and so it took about three weeks till we were selling out um, after, the, after the review came out. It was kind of what happened with Godspell, too. What we didn't know then, what took about a year to know, was that the show was going to become this sort of phenomenon. Because that has to do not so much with the show itself as with timing. You know, it, it, it just happened to be the right show for the zeitgeist at that time. Maybe. Um, it sort of super, you know, be, uh, superseded being a, a successful show. That, that we learned over, over time. Okay, and what about the fact that you cast, whoever was casting, and you're part of casting, you had two female leads, both of whom were nominated for the Tony. Neither won, but either one could have won. But those two, Chenoweth and Dina Manziel, I, I say to myself, it's interesting how very often whoever is the original cast member has an imprint on that role forever. But you do recognize that you just got very lucky. And that luck was probably a result of some geniuses also inside your organization. 
but you picked, you had two unusual, wonderful actresses, each of whom created a role that is now legendary and iconic. Well, Kristen was with us for a long time. Yes. Um, Kristen actually did the first reading that we did of, because as musicals develop, they go through a whole process where you do readings and sometimes workshops. We did over the course of the years we were working on Wicked, we actually did seven readings of the show as we were developing it. And the second one was um, the, the full show. The first one was just the first act. And um, I actually knew that Kristen happened to be in Los Angeles where we were doing the, um, the reading. And I asked her to come and read uh, Glenda, do, do Glenda for us in the, in the reading. Um, and then after we all, that is Winnie Holtzman and myself and Mark at our producer, saw Kristen in the role, we thought, well, we're never going to do better than this. So we want her to do the, the show. And um, frankly, it took a little persuasion. But, uh, you know, but Kristen was with us the whole time and had enormous impact on how the role was written. Really? Um, for one thing, I would not have written um, the soprano parts that Glinda sings if Kristen hadn't done the role yes. and said, yeah. you know, I have the soprano. Is there any way it can be incorporated into the character? Um, and then Adina was with us from about, I think, the fifth reading on. There was, by that point, Joe Mantella was directing and he felt that it would be good to start having the, um, the person who was actually gonna play Elphaba be part of it. So we did a special casting just for that role and saw about seven women, a um, couple of whom went on to play the role subsequently, either in New York or on, in the tour. Um, but yeah, we, we settled on Adina and she also was very influential, particularly musically. When I first wrote uh, Defying Gravity and I was teaching it to her um, and we got the last part, the melody uh, what basically at that point did the same thing that it does in the first two verses, which is it moves around. And Adina said, well, by this point, I'm going to be flying in the air. So I think that I should just stay up there melodically, you know, instead of doing, so if you care to find me, I should be doing, so if you care to find me. And I, you know, and just stay up there. And I said to Adina, well, you have to do that eight times a week, you know? And she was like, oh, I can do it. So that's why that got written that way. I the do. point being exactly what you've said, Mark, but even more so, um, original, the original cast has a great deal of influence on, at least in my experience, on, on the, how the show ultimately turns out and how those roles ultimately turn out. All right, I wanna to talk to you about two other of your shows. Okay. They're on the one hand, very different, and yet in some way they're not. One is very early and one is during this part of your career. Godspell, was an interesting way for you. It was one of your earliest shows, one of your most successful early shows. And Godspell's theme is based on the New Testament. Right. And it has a Christological overtone. And I wanted to understand the extent to which you, you know, a Jewish kid growing up in Long Island, what was it that drew you to a story based on the New Testament? To be honest, that, that was a gig that I was offered. Um, but I think one of the ways that I helped the show was in fact that I didn't have a background. I mean, of course I knew the Jesus story because you can't grow up in America and not know right. it. Right. But I didn't know any of those parables. <laughs> I didn't really know a, a lot about um, the, the material and therefore I came to it as a story and as a um, as a piece of theater, rather than you know as as something as as stories I'd grown up with my whole life. Yeah. So I could say things to John Michael like, you know, if the end of the show is Judas betrays Jesus, 
but but he but it's sort of out of friendship and love then they need to do a number together early in the show to show their friendship so that that so that that has impact in other words i thought of it as a new story to tell um and i think that helped uh structurally i think that helped the show um that's a, that's yeah, a fascinating so story that's how i came to it yeah okay now contrast that with prince of egypt which is a story of moses it was first an animated film and now it is your musical talk to me about how you feel about it and you know you know whatever you feel the story is in The Prince of Egypt. When we first did the animated film, and I think more so in the stage version, one of the things I liked about the approach to it was that this was a story of these two brothers who, though they, they find out they're not really biological brothers, but they think they are. One of them is Moses, who is brought into the Pharaoh's family um, as an infant, grows up there believing that he is part of this family. And his older brother, Ramesses, who is going to become the Pharaoh of Egypt, um, and therefore the most powerful man in his world. And, but the Egyptians have slaves who are Hebrew slaves. And Moses learns uh, when he is a young adult that he, he learns the truth of his birth. And this sets into motion um, a lot of conflict. He ultimately runs away and lives in the desert with a tribe called the Midianites. And one day is summoned by God, who appears in the form of a burning bush, to be the one to go back to Egypt and free his people, free Hebrews, which obviously creates enormous conflict with his brother. And, and how this plays out a story of two men to, caught up in events much larger than themselves mm -hmm. and in conflict with one another, even though they really love one another, has great emotion, great theatricality, I think. Um, I love the, the setting of it. So, um, so that I could write music that was redolent of the Middle East and had sort of the scale of Hebraic music, but also, um, you know, the harmonies of that and use instruments of the period, I mean, of the, of the, of the region. Um, you know, the, even though the show in the West End, like all West End shows, is currently on hiatus, we were very fortunate to be able to record the cast album um, before the show shuttered. And therefore, um, the cast album was just released. And so... Yes. Uh, By the way, I want yeah. our audience to know, the cast album is produced by Ghostlight Records. And if right. anybody right. wants to pick the cast album up, they go to Ghostlight Records to get the, the album. Yes. By the way, it is not exactly the Passover story, but there are certainly elements of the Passover story in it. And I was wondering to myself, to, in, in any way, did that make a difference to you? Did you in any way feel connected because it does come out of your Jewish roots in a way that God's spell did not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, the, it encompasses more than just the Passover story because it starts before it and ends after it, but just after it. But absolutely, we're doing the plagues, and we're doing the death of the firstborn, and the parting of the Red Sea, and the Hebrews passing, you know, out of Egypt. And there, there's music for that, and songs for that. And you know, the best known song uh, from the show, "When You Believe," um, is it has Hebrew in it that is the song of the sea which the hebrew tribes are supposed to have sung um when they got to the other side of the shore and so
brilliant number. How, how was that song written? What's, you know, each song has its own life. And the reason it's created this way or the other way is, is different. But how did that song get done? Um, the, the, it was suggested to me by one of the directors of the animated feature, um, Stephen Hickner, when we were on a, a field trip uh, in, actually we were in the Sinai and um, the next morning at dawn, we climbed Mount Sinai and watched the sunrise come up. But the day before, as we were riding through to where we were going to stay, Steve said, I, I think we need something anthemic, the, you know, like a big anthem for when, the, uh, when the, the Hebrews are finally released from bondage. Um, so that's what started me thinking about it. Incidentally, we've talked, we've talked about Broadway because that's who you are. It's where you have made your contribution. And it's something I love. At the same time, we started with what was your Jewish identity growing up? Come full circle. You were in it, you were in Israel. I want to know what that meant to you, if it meant anything to you at all. And how do you place yourself in terms of Jewish identity now as an adult? Well, I've I've only actually I was in Egypt for Prince of Egypt, um, but I did recently go to Israel. Um, you know, that's obviously a very emotional trip to make, uh, particularly being in the, the old city of Jerusalem. Um, having done both Godspell and, um, you know, Prince of Egypt and Children of Eden walking around in Jerusalem, where bo all those things overlap, um, w was, um, you know, very, very memorable for me emotionally. Um, I continue to think, though, that my identity is more, I guess, culturally and ethically um, a Jewish identity than from a, a religious point of view. Um, and I would say going back to Godspell, I know that obviously it's the Jesus story, but you're not really dealing in Godspell, except for the last 10 minutes of the show, you're not dealing with the passion of the Christ. Basically, it's about his teachings and the creation of a community. And the most um, significant thing in that show, the most significant teaching is always treat others as you would have them treat you. And to me, that transcends any specific religion. So I think that's where I come from more than um, any specific religious you know, ritual, ritual or, or specific um, belief. Yeah. It's a belief in the, in the ethical underpinning of um, what many religions say, though unfortunately many of its adherents, their adherents don't do that. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's what I've maybe come to at this point in my life. Okay, but you know, as I hear you describe it coming out of your own Jewishness, it is very moving to me. And I think very often the Jewish community makes a mistake. Being an observant Jew, for those who are observant Jews, is wonderful. And I am, I think every Jew should consider being more observant wherever they are on the scale. But it's not about that primarily. It's about what you have spoken about. And it is this sense of, a, I'm part of a people, that's the cultural. And there is this drive that we, that you and I both grew up with. And it's in us. We, whether the, the, uh, and you and I have different levels of observance. Doesn't matter. There's a commonality in what we experienced. What we experienced was inherent in the cultural Jewish identity we were brought up with was a certain set of values that we thought were important. And that it was about extending the compassion and the patience and the talent and the loveliness that we would want everybody to experience, including ourselves. And so I am very moved by the way you say it. Thank you. I, want I, mean, to that, that, I was just going to say that, you know, those values, although my parents were not 
temple going Jews, those values were very, very important to them. Um, and that's why I talk about sort of cultural Jewish values and they're important to me and I pass them on to my children. And from what I can tell, they're important to them and um, they're passing them on to their children. So there's, there's definitely a, a heritage involved here um, that, that I do feel really strongly about. And I feel part of that heritage. So Stephen, I want you to let me talk to you for one moment about Pippin. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, you've described how some of the other shows you've done sort of came to be collaboratively or somebody brings you a book. Tell me how, how you end up working on Pippin. Well, Pippin evolved. Um, it started when I was a student at Carnegie Mellon and there was a club at Carnegie Mellon, an extracurricular club that produced an original student written music every year. And I became part of that club when I first got there. And my friend Ron Strauss found a paragraph in a history textbook about the son of Charlemagne and a plot against his, to overthrow his father. And at that time, as drama students, we were very taken with James Goldman's The Lion in Winter and all the sort of medieval court intrigue and it very theatrical. And we thought it would be fun to do a musical that had that in it. So when we did the show at Carnegie Mellon, and it was called for some reason Pippin Pippin at the time, um, it was basically medieval melodrama set to music. But then as um, when, I, when I left school and came to New York and some people had heard some of the music and were interested in developing the show, it sort of evolved and evolved so that the medieval part of it and the overthrow of, the, uh, of Charlemagne part of it became less central and it became more and more a story of the young man in search of himself what to do with his life. And there were a lot of contemporary references. Of course, the Vietnam War was going on at that time. So the show very, very much evolved to become what it is now. Um, you know, it, it wasn't like some other shows like, like A Wicked or A Prince of Egypt where things changed about the show, but the basic story never changes. Here, the story changed enormously as it yes. evolved. Yes. Talk to me about the philosophy of Pippin. If somebody said to you, at the end of the play, what's Pippin's statement all about? And does it mean it's just one continuous loop of misery? Is there any sense of, as we struggle through life, we move forward? Because when I see Pippin, part of what makes me uncomfortable is I feel that the message is not a message I see in many other of the works you've done, which is why I began by asking you to what extent was it your conception. But say anything you want about my reaction to the end of Pippin and how it makes me in some way uncomfortable. Well, the end of Pippin is that he chooses a life that is maybe not as glamorous and not as, to use the word in Pippin, extraordinary as um, what he thought he wanted. But he has come to see that the, the pursuits he's been having are bas have been dead ends, literally. And that he, in this life with this woman that he falls in love with and her son and, and making that kind of life for himself is going to be fulfilling for him. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be extraordinary, but it's real life. Um, but then what is dark about the show, but, but I think is wonderful, is that the young man who is now his adopted son he's now become his stepfather 
stays behind and we see he's going to go on the same journey that Pippin same goes, journey. had to go on. Yes. Because we all do. We all go on these journeys where um, we can make choices that are ultimately self-destructive. Um, a lot of people don't recover from that. Um, why I think Pippin is a positive show is that he does recover and he does make a positive choice. But we don't know what Theo's choice is ultimately going to be. Um, you know, each one of us goes on this journey with um, uh, constructive and destructive voices in our heads. And which ones we finally listen to and give over to, that's, you know, that's an individual journey that each person has to take. So to me, it feels very real and realistic. Um, but it's, it's definitely not, you know, um, everyone will live happily ever after. It sounds to me like in some way, there is a philosophy behind what you tried to do in Pippin that reflects who you yeah. are in part. Is that fair? Very much so, yeah. I mean, I feel like, look, I'm, I'm not writing shows to try and proselytize. Right. I'm not trying to persuade anybody, you should believe this or you should do this or the moral of the story is thus and so. I'm, but I'm, I'm writing out of my own point of view about the world, about our individual responsibilities to ourselves, to each other, to the world, et cetera. And um, yeah, that's, that's the only way I know how to write is, is to write from my point of view. But, but it's not as if I'm trying to preach or teach lessons to people. Each, each audience member will take what he or she takes from from one of the shows and have their own responses to it and it will mean you know whatever it means to them and and i wouldn't want to um narrow that down yes that's beautiful i asked you earlier are your parents happy with the choices you've made are they proud of you and it's clear they were supportive i'm they must be just thrilled with the success you've had, and not only whatever money may have come with the success, but the success you've had in being able to be creative and express yourself, and the gift you've given audiences. Stephen, I hope at some point in a quiet moment, you're able to enjoy the gift you've given to other people. Mazal tov, Yashako, all the best. Thank you. Everybody in your line of work gets a certain question. I'm going to ask it, not because I think it's the right question, but because, Stephen, I am genuinely interested in how you create. Explain to me the process of lyric and music and how the two ultimately synthesize. And are there times when you hear a melody in your head and the words come later, are there times when the words are there first and the melody comes later? And just talk about that. You're absolutely right that it can go, sometimes it's lyric leads, sometimes the music leads, but um, because I'm writing both, they kind of go back and forth. Um, I've, over, over the years, I've realized that what's good for me is to figure out what is the title the song. So, for instance, um, you know, in, in Pippin, I wanted for his quote, I want on, I wanted to find a metaphor, an image that was understandable, but kind of fantastical too, a little bit impossible. And when I arrived at Corner of the Sky, that that's what he was seeking, was something that we all know what that means, but it also doesn't actually exist. Once I knew that he was going to sing, I've got to find my corner of the sky, then the, the music flowed from that and then specific words. Or, or like in Prince of Egypt, the newest show, the, the first song um, for Moses, which is called Footprints on the Sand. Moses sings that when he um, doesn't actually know what he wants, but he feels this sort of yearning inside him, but he thinks his life is just going to vanish. Um, and then when I thought of the image, because 
they're growing up in the desert, obviously, of footprints on the sand and how evanescent those are. But then you can leave footprints on the sands of time. But then the music came before the rest of the words. like what is the song about what's the story you're telling what does the character feel what is what is he or she trying to accomplish either for him and to himself him or herself or to others and that drives it on the other hand for instance um defying gravity from wicked i had that the, the sort of riff the i'm not at a piano but the thing that goes like Dum, 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 dum. I had that as sort of the sound of the witch coming into her full power. And then the song, and then I had the title, Defying Gravity, and the song evolved out of that. So it's always like this little germ and always involving a title, and then it sort of sprouts from there. I want to know the history of one other song of yours. Because I knew you. Okay, yeah, that's another one I could have talked about. I have two good stories about For Good, um, which is the last song from Wicked and um, the heart of the show. I mean, it took me, I, I, I did write that song for a long time when we were working on the show because I knew how important it was that, that it was going to be the sort of beating heart of the show, the ultimate expression of the relationship between the two women. And um, so we had to get it right. And then when I finally felt ready to write it, um, I called Winnie, my collaborator, the book writer, and we were just talking about the, you know, what they were gonna say to each other and what was the story of the song. And at a certain point he said, well, they've, you know, they've been so important in one another's lives. I mean, they've, they've really changed each other for good. And then I was like, stop, stop right there. That's the title of the song. So I'm hanging up now. This is such a brilliant title. We only take credit for having heard it when Winnie said it, because it means two things, of course. Um, but then my daughter, Jessica, was, happened to be up visiting at the, right at this time. And so I went to her and asked her about a long-term friendship she's had with a friend of hers that she's known since she was seven. And, you know, they've been friends all their lives. And their friendship has, there have been points where they're angry at each other and not speaking. And then, you know, best friends and helping each other and so, and so on. And I said, her friend's name is Sarah. And I said, Jess, I want you to imagine that you are never going to see Sarah again. And you have one opportunity to tell her what she means to you and what your friendship has meant. What would you say? And I had like a yellow pad like this one and I had my little pencil and she started to talk about her friend Sarah and I wrote things down and she said, you know, I think people come into our lives for a reason. You know, she said a lot of things that just went right into the song. And I think one of the reasons that maybe people um, identify with the song is because so much, much of it came out of the truth of a real relationship that my daughter was describing. Wow, that is a well. And um, in some way, it says so much about you as well. It's very Jewish. I don't know if you're aware of that. Of course. Because I yeah, knew you, I've been changed <laughs> for good. No, it just, just, 
just fabulous. It has been so wonderful for you to give me this kind of time. You have made a major contribution to American culture time and time and time again. We are proud of you. I know your parents are proud of you. I'm sure your family is proud of you. And most of all, it is, I now feel I have another friend and I thank you. I thank, kol tuva hatzlecha, only goodness, success. Thank you for this time. And if there's anything we can ever do for you, you let me know, all right? Thank you so much, Mark. This has really been fun. It's been a real pleasure. Steven Schwartz, one of America's great musical composers and a lovely human being. I hope you've enjoyed meeting him on the Chaim. As always, I invite you to be in touch with him with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of the Chaim. Please email me at rabbigolub at jbstv.org. And remember, you can now take the Chaim anywhere you go as a podcast. Just download podcast the Chaim and enjoy. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.